Good, okay. Welcome and hello from our side. Today we would like to show you how we build our lightning fast for AutoDE. But first we would like to uh, give us an introduction of who we are. Okay, uh, I will start to introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Tom, I'm a software developer and I started my career working with Solar and Java and uh, Lucene. And currently I'm in the same team as Toby is and we are working a lot with Python. I am kind of the DevOps person in the team, so I also take uh, care of the infrastructure and I also care about the security and make sure that all of my colleagues uh, behave securely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he, he's doing a very good job. Um, my name is Tobias. I'm also part of Team Squirrel. This is the name uh, of the team who's responsible for the auto suggestion, auto DE. For the past nine years, I worked with all these great search technology like Solar, Lucene, Elasticsearch, and mainly worked with uh, Java. Um, but now in the last year, I switched a little bit over to Kotlin and uh, Python, and I really liked it. Um, and beside that, I'm father of three children, husband, and I'm the organizer of the search technology meetup here in Hamburg. So if you would like to join the search technology meetup, there will be an, a next round starting in a new year. Um, just go on meetup.com and check out the search technology meetup there. And we are both totally in love with our auto suggest on AutoDE. This is the auto suggest. Um, hopefully, everyone knows what an auto suggest is. So, if you start to type anything into the search bar um, there at the top, there will be some suggestions. And this is what we are doing for roughly one year. And we in our team, we are Team Squirrel. We are responsible for exactly this, this, and we in our team, we're working cross-functional. That means we have a lot of great position in our team. We have front-end developers, back-end developers, infrastructure guys, data scientists, analysts, product manager, and project managers. That means if we would like to create a feature, if you would, would like to develop a new feature for the customer, um, we are not blocked by any other team, and this is very cool. And another cool thing is uh, in our team, we are working vertical. So that means we are responsible for the auto suggest from front to the back end. And um, that also means we are responsible for the whole infrastructure, for, the, uh, for our costs, for our experiments, and for our outcome. And this is something which is really cool and did not block us in, in any way. And um, when we started the team, we developed a an, an short microsite and short internal microsite where we show some features that we are currently working on. And um, there we, we placed our vision. So we started in our team with the vision, your answer is just one step ahead. And this is something we are currently working towards. So we want to, we want to show the user the best answer he can imagine. So that means he started to type and whatever it is, we can identify this and we would like to suggest the user the best answer on the first place. So that means it could be a redirect, it could be an answer to a question, it could be a product, it could be a query, whatever. We are using a lot of technology to try this. And what we are doing the whole day is that we are delivering. So you can see these are at the top, these are requests. So we have a, of about 3 million requests per day, um, 3 million visits per day on our website. And um, our auto-suggest receives of about 400 requests per second in peak times. And our P99 response time is, a, it is between 20 and 30 milliseconds. So this is a very cool environment. And yeah, we want, we want to take you on our journey, what we did in the last year, or what we learned and what we, where we failed. And we started together in our team with um, at the first point. You can see here in the timeline. So we started with, OK, well, it works. And we started to remove one service, the auto suggest, from another team and move this to our team. So we migrated it, and we had a very simple architecture. You can see it here. There's the customer. Then there's a little bit of front end in between. And then there's the Higgins. The Higgins is our auto-suggest service in the backend, which delivers the queries to the customer. So everything is in one application, and we started with exactly this architecture. 
And inside Higgins, we are storing the queries in a data structure. And this data structure is called a try. Maybe some of you know that data structure. It's a very simple data structure. So here you can see the example if we are indexing queries like um, shirt, short, and socks. This is a tree which will be um, uh, which will be calculated, and it's very easy to store to do a prefix matching on that data structure. And for sure, it's very fast. But then everything was good. We started to run and. Then we thought about, OK, we had some requirements. The first requirement was, let's do some A-B testing. And we thought, OK, we have one monolith. And how can we do A-B testing with that? And we were very smart. And uh, so we started to just add feature toggles into our monolith. And yeah, then the journey begins. And in the end, the result was code that was hard to maintain, because in our Python app, um, we, are, we passed all the feature toggles into the functions. And then we added another feature, another feature, another variable was added to the function scope, so on and so forth. And if you have more than four or five features, in, uh, feature toggles in your app, the, your code starts to begin a little bit unclean or hard to maintain, hard to read. And um, I know that there are some libraries out there that are doing a great job in feature toggles, but this was our beginning. And this was not the best thing. And we thought, let's create an architecture which is like a little bit more like plug and play. So this was the next step. And we started to add feature branch deployment. That means, so we, we, are we, we have a code um, on Git, and if you add a feature branch, that means a branch that starts with the prefix feature slash, a completely new environment will be spinned up. And you can see here, there's an Higgins 1, and there's an Higgins 2. So if there's a feature branch that will be deployed, it will create a complete new environment, including a new cache. And then um, we thought about that thing. And it was very cool because now um, you can create very easily pull requests to the main because you know the Higgins 1 always delivers and always have a very clean code base. This helps us a lot. But then we needed a service, a service that distributes the request between these, let's say, feature branch environments. And so we created a new service which is called Prism. And these two names, you need to remember the whole talk. Prism is a distribution service which distributes the request, and Higgins are the, let's say, the service uh, with the business logic. And um, we did a little bit of, bit of performance tests with the Prism, and we found out that Kotlin might be the best language here, and we uh, created this application based on the Spring, uh, in a Spring application, and uh, we heavily used coroutines here. What we also added into Prism is and static fallback. That means if a subservice did not answer in a specific time, we will delivering a static fallback. Why did we do this? Because Prism is based on the principle that we always want to deliver something to the customer in any case. That means if all the subservices are not available, we deliver. And this is very cool. That means our new architecture looks like we have a two layer now, two layer architecture. At the, at the top, you see the tech and distribution layer, which is the prism. And then at the bottom, you can see the business layer with the two Higginses. Then we were done. Everything was cool. Everything was fine. And then we thought about ah, this caching instances here in Higgins. If we have four or five feature branches, ah, it, these are costs that yeah we don't need that cost. So let's move this caching up into the prism. So we have the caching logic only in the distribution layer, which we thought might be a very cool thing. And we thought, OK, how complicated is this? Could this caching be? This, this is no problem there. So um, the next step was caching is never the problem. So we uh, implemented it. Everything was fine. We merged it here. I merged it. Um, and yeah, we added a cache into Prism. We removed the cache out of Higgins. And then on the next day, we deployed it. And yeah, 
We went offline for half an hour. This was not good. <laughs> But we were delivering because we have the static fallback. So this was a very good uh, live test for our static fallback. We delivered the whole uh, half an hour, some, let's say, random, the top queries to the customer. But you can type anything inside the search box always. Uh, there will be always the same query returned. Um, yeah, we also saw this pattern on the CPU usage. And yeah, we started to analyze the whole thing a little bit. For sure, we rolled back in a half an hour. Um, this was a little bit too long, but it is as it is. We started to analyze the whole problem and we take a look into the caching database metrics. And there we saw this graph and we were a little bit shocked. Uh, every day at nine o'clock, the cache was full. The memory usage was full. There was no memory available to store more uh, caching entries. At, and after eight o'clock um, in, in the night, it's it's getting okay again. So the cache was not used the whole day. This is what the current graph just show. And we thought caching never the problem. No, no problem. Let's just increase the instance, the caching instance size. So we increased it. We have a larger instance of the caching, uh, a larger caching instance size. But this didn't fix the problem. And then we dig a little bit deeper and in the prism, we added an access log where we can see how our serving is being used. And this is what's very important to know how the customer uses your service. And we have a statistic uh, like in slow log, let's say, where you can see all the uh, slow running queries or long running queries. And we found a pattern then a that a lot of queries failed at the specified timeout. And then we thought a little bit about that and we did we implemented a bug, <laughs> basically. So uh, the main problem was that we forgot to cache long-running queries. That means we, we are asking the subservice. The subservice does not respond in a specific time. And there is an exception, and that's all. And we did not cache. And then the next long-running query comes in, fails, <laughs> nothing happened. Okay. That's smart, so uh, not so smart. This is why we added an async cache to the prism. And we tried to build this with spring, spring caching with a cacheable annotation. And in, in combination with coroutines in Kotlin, it doesn't work for us. So we, uh, we tried it one week and it doesn't work. Um, so, and this is some kind of code. Uh, how we implemented it, so you can see at the top, um, we are querying the candidate, so the subservice, let's say, uh, within a specific timeout. Then you can see the beautiful Kotlin syntax here within a coroutine scope. And if there is an exception, and especially if there is a timeout exception, and this is the new part which we forgot in our first release, um, let's query that subservice again and try to cache the response asynchronously. And basically this is an, an fire and forget feature. So we are querying the service in the background with an async coroutine and um, just let it cache the response, which was very helpful for us. But then, yeah, the next days start. Yeah, so uh, we thought, nice, now we are done, we have the caching fixed, it's cached asynchronously, even a slow request. But then uh, we looked at our graphs and uh, we saw that and we thought, uh, what is happening to the CPU? So we knew currently there was an Onyx running, but we did not deploy anything, we did not do any changes to Prism or to Higgins, so we investigated. And the problem was that not, not only the CPU was affected, but also our other graphs were affected. So at the top, you see our uh, cache timings. Obviously, because the CPU was uh, used more, uh, those timings were higher. But the most problematic one is the bottom one. The bottom one is our user timing. So you see that also our user timing uh, increased, which is not good. We, do, we want to deliver fast. Um, so what you can see on the very right of the graphs, there is an annotation that was our um, fix, so to say, we just increased the instance size and it was faster again. This was not a long term fix, we knew that, but it was working and it gave us some space to just investigate the problem 
in a bit more detail to find out why our CPU usage uh, just suddenly doubled. And this brings us to our next section. Uh, yeah, so the problem. Um, there was nothing that we changed, but we had this experiment running. And what we do to identify which uh, group and user is in is that we get a specific header, which is basically just a long string. And then we have a pattern like you see there. So a static string like foo in the middle and then just some stuff out uh, at the t uh, front and at the back. And we take this long header string, we try to find this foo pattern, and then we are interested in one specific character. And at the time where our CPU usage increased so much, the experiment stopped. So foo was not in the header anymore. And we thought, okay, what? Uh, what happens here with the regex? And the keyword is catastrophic backtracking. What does that mean? So uh, you have a regex pattern like the foo. You have your long string like the experiment header that we have. And then you have a regex engine. You give both to the regex engine and say, here, here, please find the pattern. And then the engine tries all the possible characters because there's a dot star. Then it tries to find the foo at the beginning, at the end, and everywhere in the middle. And basically, it just tries all the combinations. And with a dot star and uh, having a long string, there are many combinations. So we tried it out. It were uh, multiple tens of thousands combinations. And this, this trying to find the pattern and not finding it, that was causing um, the increase in CPU usage. So after we identified that, uh, we knew, OK, basically, we have two options. So first, nobody really knows how to write a good regex pattern just out of the box. So maybe we can try to make it smarter. Um, we actually tried that for the end of the day. You saw it was around afternoon when we found uh, the problem and tried to improve it. Uh, we, we weren't able to. And then we thought, OK, maybe we just need something else. Second option to just replace the regex. So we uh, left for the day, and then the next day, this is uh, the conversation between me and Toby in the morning. <laughs> so I greeted him. Um, on the left, you can see the timings for the regex uh, matching. Um, it is for uh, th like, like 1,000 iterations, so not one tr uh, finding, but uh, just to give you a comprehension. And the right thing is the new one. You see it's magnitudes uh, faster than uh, the previous solution. And you possibly have the same question like Toby had, <laughs> like, how? <laughs> Um, so actually, this solution was really simple, index of. So I mean, our usage of the regex was, we have a long string, we have a short string. We want to know where in this long string the short uh, string is located. So index of does exactly that. So what we do now is um, we have our experiment header string. We get the uh, index where foo starts. Then we add the length of foo, and there is basically the one single character that we are interested in. So our learning was, OK, regex was just way too complicated for our simple use case. And um, so we, we implemented that, we deployed that, and the uh, CPU usage was fine again. So this solved uh, that problem, and we were also able to reduce the instance size again that we previously had to increase to just give us some space to investigate. and. Then we thought, nice, now Prism is also working if we have no experiment running. So we thought, nice, uh, done it's for the second time. But no. So uh, we always look at our graphs. So every day, we have uh, one person that constantly looks at the graphs, especially for Prism and our user timings. And we also looked more deeply into the graphs when we had this CPU problem and we had no idea what caused it. And uh, at the top, you see uh, our user timing, and you see there are a lot of spikes every now and then. And we are also quite close to the threshold that we define for ourselves. And we don't want that. And at the bottom, you see a graph uh, for our static fallbacks. So we measure how often in a day we uh, give the static fallback to a customer. And it's, it's a handful per day. So it's not like every minute we give uh, uh, back 10 static fallbacks or something, but we wanted zero. We want every customer to get a valid suggestion so that they can, can directly move to the uh, product uh, page or search results or help page that they want to get. 
So we needed to find a solution there. And we had uh, different suspicions, so we thought maybe um, maybe there's something up with our spell check, because we also have spell checking there, and that was not really performant. Um, so then, uh, during the next time, Toby did some researching. And he was also re uh, researching about the spell check, and he thought, hmm, maybe there's something that we can find. And actually, he didn't find something for the spell check, but he found another thing. He found a blog article uh, written by Wolf Gabe about a pruning Reddix try. And we all thought, <laughs> what is that? Um, we just knew our try. I hope you all remember the data structure in Higgins, where we have our suggestions in. And pruning Reddix try basically sounded like a fancy version of that. Um, so we thought, maybe that's something that we can try out. Maybe it helps us to just get some minor improvements. Um, but there was a problem. Um, it is written in C Sharp. And <laughs> We have a Python service, and nobody in our team ever read or wrote a single line of C-sharp code. So <laughs> we couldn't just take it and use it. Um, so what we did is um, that we still wanted to level up. So uh, at one day, so we always can get some, I would say, slack time where we can try some innovations out. So I sat down and said, ah, C-sharp, it's just if else. Python is also just if else. What can happen? Um, so uh, we ported it to Python, and it actually works. And we also made it open source. You all can get it if you need a fast uh, try. Um, and we implemented that. And what is a pruning Redix try? So do you get an idea? So um, you saw the try. Um, it's basically a tree, and you turn it upside down, and the root is at the top. Uh, but it's not fast, and it's really not fast if you just use the default try that we have, if you have short input queries. Because the problem is, if you have some query like t, then you uh, give Higgins the query t, and Higgins retrieves a really good chunk of the try. And so that you get a grasp of the dimension, our try consists of around 3 million suggestions. So if you type t, you get a few hundred thousand. And then Higgins has to re-rank all of those. And then Higgins throws away like basically nearly all, all of the work just to give us 10 suggestions. And that's mildly stupid and highly inefficient. Um, so what the pruning Reddix try does is that for each node, you sort the children in uh, the try. And uh, you can just, by sorting this, you can build an uh, uh, early termination algorithm. So you just get the top 10 suggestions if you only need 10, and then you just stop. So we thought, yeah, that looks fine, but now it's Friday, and it's the suggest, and <laughs> maybe we shouldn't break it. Um, but we also knew that the weekend was coming, and we want to give all of our customers a great experience. Uh, so I said, <laughs> okay, we just go live. And we went live, and it actually worked. Um, so these are our graphs. At the top, you see, um, you know that Prism has the coroutines, and we time all of the coroutines. And the right annotation Grafana was the deployment of the Higgins with the new tribe. And our response times just uh, went down and it suddenly was really, really smooth. All the fuzziness in the graph is gone and also in our user timings, all the spikes are gone and we are finally um, below our threshold and also have a very stable response time graphs. But most importantly, the static fallback is gone. I don't know what is on the right there. There was one evil request. But overall, we just don't use the static fallback anymore. It's really just existing currently in Prism. It's there if we have like a real disaster, but it's basically not used. So then we were a bit scarred from our past experiences, and we thought, oh, is this now really done? But uh, I can assure you, yes. Um, so this was the last big major change that we did. And now we are at the uh, uh, present time. And just to recap our journey a bit. So uh, we as a team started in September 2021. We started with uh, the small Higgins, the monolith, where like everything was inside, the experiment logic, the caching, the business logic. Um, but well, it worked. Um, and it worked good enough for the time being. And now we are at uh, the right side. So now we have Prism. We have a complete separation between the business logic and all this technical knowledge and the experiment logic. And uh, this is now 
really stably running. So basically, we don't really have to do anything in Prism. It just exists and it works. Um, we are doing minor improvements, like using ARM instances, uh, upgrading a Python version, minor fixes, and uh, looking into gRPC as an alternative to HTTP for the backend communication. Um, but now we are at a point with our infrastructure where we can completely focus on feature development, making uh, the spell check faster, making it better, uh, doing some contextualization to give our customers uh, a better experience that really fits uh, them as a person. So to recap uh, everything that we just talked about, we want to finish with some key learnings. Obviously, most important, you have to make screenshots so that you can make a talk at the conference. Um, but uh, importantly, uh, to make screenshots, you need something to screenshot. So visibility really is key. And for us, it really helped us. So um, we have our slow log with the queries where we saw that short queries are somehow uh, a bigger problem than longer ones. We have our cache usage, we have our coroutine timings, and all the metrics about our uh, internal workings. So really make sure that on the one side, you know how your systems behave internally, and on the other side, you need to track how your systems are used. And we especially don't mean you should just track your users, but track what they do with your system. So in our case, we just track the query. We just need the query. We, we don't care who sent the query, but we are interested in the query string. So that's what we track, and that's what you saw also in the slow log. And uh, the second one is iterate. So maybe some of you think now, oh, if we look back at the architecture, wouldn't have, uh, it have been way smarter if you just started with Pism? But you should always keep in mind what your goal is. Because in September 2021, Prism wouldn't have been a smart solution then. Our goal at that point was we had this um, team that had the Suggest and and other products. They had way much to do for the people they were being. And our goal was to just get the Suggest, get it out of there and do it fast, but also stable. And if we would have tried to build something like Prism at the moment, we first of all, wouldn't have been able to do that um, because we just hadn't the knowledge about how the suggest works and what kind of things we need to take care about. And it wouldn't have helped us on our journey because it, wouldn't ha it would have taken much longer than it uh, took with that architecture. So the other team would have uh, needed to take care of the architecture way longer, which would have uh, slowed them uh, down also. So see what do you need now? What is something that you can do later, but always keep track of what you can improve like we do with our metrics. Always see what are the next steps and just get better day by day. You don't need to always uh, do it with a big bang. So um, the next thing, and basically that's what we did with our whole architecture is uh, work uh, uh, towards enabling yourself. So what we did with that architecture is that we really enabled ourselves to try features. So Higgins 2 can just die and we don't care because we know that Prism takes care about that. Prism will just fall back to Higgins 1 or to the static fallback. And this enables us to try out experimental features. This also enables us to, for example, if we have apprentices in our team, we can tell them, hey, if you want to build a suggest, feel free to do that. We put it into Prism and if your suggest doesn't respond, well, then that's how it is, but it will not kill our live uh, service. So enable yourself technically, but also enable yourself uh, team-wise. So in our team, uh, like you saw with the Pruning Reddix try, we went live on a Friday. And we were able to do that because we know if some of us breaks production, nobody will blame you for that. So work towards a team environment where you can be sure that your teammates will support you and will help you fix that and also make sure that you have a good disaster recovery strategy so that you know how to fix your tools if they break. Um, so enable yourself in both of these aspects. And the last point, share your knowledge. So you saw that we found this blog article about pruning Redix try. We researched a lot about different spell checking mechanisms. We also all were getting better at Python. We didn't have that much experience, especially Toby and me. We came from the Java world. Um, so we read a lot there and we just gained so much from the learnings of others and the knowledge that they shared. So do that, discuss with other people, uh, exchange experiences, uh, experiences, questions, and 
also, and you all are doing that currently, which is very, very good, um, take part at conferences and share your uh, experiences there and meet some people. Yes, and so going to conferences is not the whole thing, so please feel free to use the whole conference to communicate, to ask questions, to discuss something, to uh, maybe to reach out to us later. We are, uh, we are there at the Otto booth, I think, during the day. Um, so enjoy your time, uh, discuss together the features so we can maybe next year share another great learning and another some failings here and there. Um, we would like to say thanks. Thank you so much for listening to our talk. Um, if you would like to learn more about our findability department, Hendrik is going to have a talk in Kinofia at 3 o'clock. So free, feel free to join there. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>